Thank you very much um, for your kind welcome. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. And on behalf of the government, your government, I want to congratulate Orla and Laura as well, and the wider team in the National Women's Council of Ireland for organising today's event. And in December, as Ellen said, we marked 100 years since women were allowed to vote and run for election. Today's event is one of a small number of events that the Department of Culture, Heritage and the Gales of is supporting financially in recognition of this very special centenary. And crucially, by being here today, we are all carrying on that struggle of full equality. But it's back in 1919 that I would like to start before moving to Ireland today and the issues affecting young women like you. And I'd like you to imagine this for a moment. A little over 100 years ago, no woman in this room, solely because she was female, was permitted to run for election in this country. As a woman in Ireland, no matter how educated or intelligent, it could not be done. Even if that woman was bursting with ideas and reforming policies, she could not bring them forward. It wasn't that she wouldn't contemplate it, it was simply that she was prohibited by doing so by law. Her thoughts and ruminations of a better society would have to remain in her mind and in her dreams at night. She could, of course, share her views and opt opinions with her husband, brother, father, or other male relative or friend. And he, if he was inclined to listen to her, might consider her statements good enough to carry forward, but he might not. He wasn't obliged to do so. And for the majority of women, it was easier to say nothing, to remain mute, and to know your place. And that is understandable. Tasked with rearing families, household duties, and volunteerism, there was enough work to keep a woman occupied. But yesterday's woman of a hundred years ago was a subspecies. She was discriminated against since the day of her birth, her femininity, a handicap, her capabilities and opportunity to contribute to public life blatantly repressed. But who would dare try to change it? Well, for some women to have to remain consistently submissive and subservient to the male gender had taken its toll. They knew deep in the recesses of their collective psyche that it wasn't alone the fact that women refused to express, but that there was an accepted, tolerated, and innate prejudice against us because we were women. That being female was lesser than being male. That we were not equal. We were not equal because the law explicitly said so. And these courageous suffragists wanted to change the status quo. And so the fight began. And let's be honest here, it was a fight. Women were jailed, pilloried, and abused, but they rallied together, holding public meetings and private meetings. They shared leaflets and postcards and put up posters with words like, women can canvas, why can't they vote? And these magnificent, magnificent women, some of them in their teens and twenties, methodically, meticulously, and bravely disseminated information to all in their path. And I pay tribute today to all those suffragettes who, because of their efforts on our behalf, paved the way for women to take the rightful and necessary place in Dáil Éireann and Shannad Éireann. Countess Markovic stood for election just over 100 years ago, and she was only one of 16 women candidates throughout Ireland and the UK to put their name on the ballot paper. She was the only woman elected, with 7,835 votes or 65.9% of the poll in the constituency of Dublin St. Patrick's. She also left, later represented my own constituency of Dublin Rathdown. And I also sit under her portrait at Cabinet. Her face, the sole female on the wall among the eight male portraits of the luminaries like Pierce, Emmett, Parnell, Grattman, Wolftone, O'Connell, and Sarsfield. And as Ellen said, I sit around the cabinet table now, a hundred years later, the 19th female cabinet minister since the foundation of the state, with the 18th Regina Dorothy, <coughs> the 16th Mary Mitchell O'Connor, the 15th Heather Humphreys, and the 10th Catherine Zapone. And I'm also, as Ellen said, the first female solicitor in cabinet. Although well, women could finally vote and stand for election, this was a qualified freedom as the representation of the People Act specified that in order for a woman to vote, 
she had to be at least 30 years of age and either married to a man who owned property or owned it herself. So this probably rules out many in the room today. And despite this ridiculous restriction, that electorate expanded significantly from 700,000 to 2 million people. And I'm ashamed to say that not alone did it take another 60 years for a woman to take a seat at the cabinet table, it also took a further decade before the full equal franchise was extended to all women over the age of 21, regardless of property qualification, and that was through the representation of the People Act 1928. And I regret having to say 100 years on, Countess Markovitz's work remains unfinished. 100 years on, we have not achieved a full equality in this country. A 22% in Dole Éireann and 32% in Shannon Éireann, female representation in the Houses of the Oireachtas is way behind what it should be. We must take up the mantle once worn by Countess Markovitz and so many inspiring women like her and work to ensure that our progress continues. It is not that women are better or worse than men, but we do bring a different perspective. A perspective that is sorely needed, not just in government, but throughout our society. We know from experience that diversity of opinion leads to better decision making.